I hope you are all well and safe as we begin to see some light at the end of this long pandemic tunnel. I'm here with Dr. John Weber, professor in the School of Pharmacy at Memorial University. I know those of you attending can't see who else is in the room, but we have a full house. There was over 240 registrants and nearly 100 attendees right now and more joining every second. So we're delighted about that. We will begin today's event with a land acknowledgement. We acknowledge that the lands on which Memorial University's campuses are situated are in the traditional territories of diverse indigenous groups. And we acknowledge with respect the histories and cultures of the Beothic, Mi'kmaq, Innu and Inuit of this province. We encourage everyone to reflect on these lands from where you are located and the indigenous peoples for whom these lands are traditional territories. At the Office of Alumni Engagement, we are focused on offering many ways for you to connect with Memorial from anywhere in the world. We are working diligently to create opportunities to celebrate, socialize, mentor, and advance both your career and improve your life. Embarking on new and exciting ways to build relationships with our Memorial family of over 100,000 members is vital to our evolution as an institution. You, our alumni and friends, are our greatest ambassadors. You are a worldwide community of professionals, leaders, change makers who advance the reputation of our university, our province and our world. So please consider getting involved with our programming. There are mentoring opportunities with 10,000 coffees, opportunities to meet up with Newfoundland and Labrador expats through Global NL. And we have an online book club called Coastlines that is featuring Newfoundland and Labrador authors who are also Memorial alumni. So you can find out more details about all of these initiatives on our website, www.mun.ca forward slash alumni. So thank you for joining us today for a discussion about the healing powers of berries on the brain. Studies have shown that antioxidants found in blueberries can help protect the brain from aging, inflammation, and neurodegenerative disorders. Dr. Weber and his team believe berry extracts may be beneficial to cardiovascular health and to reduce the effects of some diseases and help protect against the effects of traumatic brain injuries. So just a few housekeeping items. A brief Q&A will follow the presentation. I will be monitoring the Q&A function, which you will find at the bottom right-hand side of your screen. Please try to keep your questions short, and I encourage you to post questions as soon as possible. Don't leave it till the last minute. We have a very full program, and we'll only have limited time to take questions. You are not able to unmute your microphone or turn on your video. We are streaming live, but a final reminder that this session is being recorded, and you will receive a link to the event in a follow-up email. So it gives me great pleasure to introduce our special guest today. Dr. John T. Weber is a professor in the School of Pharmacy at Memorial University. He holds an MSc in Pharmaceutical Sciences from the University of Montana, a PhD in Pharmacology and Toxicology from Medical College of Virginia, and completed postdoctoral research in neurophysiology at Erasmus Medical Center in Rotterdam. He currently conducts research on the chemical constituents and biological activities of berries native to Newfoundland and Labrador, primarily using animal and cellular models. This research is focused on the effects of berries on neurodegeneration and neuroinflammation. So I'd now like to turn the presentation over to Dr. Weber. Uh, thank you uh, very much for the introduction, Andrea. So, as you heard, I'm I'm John Weber, and I'm I'm trained as a pharmacologist and a neuroscientist. And I've always I've had a long interest in natural products. So, very fortunately, I've been able to combine all of these um, all these interests, um, experience, and interests. So, I'm just going to give an overview, roughly about you know 30 minutes or so of some of the research I've done for about the past 10 or 12 years, uh, some of the findings from my lab, and some other findings as well. And then leave time, of course, uh, plenty of time for some questions and answers. And thanks to everyone for attending today. It's obviously a very beautiful day here uh, on the island, at least on the, on the Avalon. So, okay. So I think probably everyone attending knows what berries are. Um, typically, we're we're talking about the fruits of berry. You know, they're called berry producing plants. And of course, cranberries, strawberries, um, bilberries, and raspberries are all found. Um, on the island, not as much, of course, uh, naturally called strawberries are more typically cultivated. And of course, we have bake apples, which are also known as cloudberries, um, as well as partridge berries, which more typically you'll see the name lingonberry 
Um, and there's other terms as well, like uh, sorry, which is a Cree word. Um, and a lot of these, these berries, um, and not just the fruits, but the leaves have been used by indigenous peoples for, for centuries. Uh, I just uh, wrote a paper about that that I was very happy about that will be coming out in a few months. Okay, so probably most of you have heard about antioxidants, and that is related to oxidative stress and, and the ability or less, that plants actually hold the ability to fight oxidative stress. So what oxidative stress? It's related to oxygen, but um, of course, oxygen, we need oxygen to survive, obviously. We breathe it in. It's necessary for metabolism and a lot of physiological processes, but it can be metabolized into damaging sub, uh, substances like superoxide, which is shown here a little bit on the left, and hydroxyl radicals, for example. And typically, our body can handle that load um, but as you age, and if you um, ingest toxic species, for example, then there are, our, our body basically needs more than what's what we have in it to fight that. So berries, the fruits and the leaves actually have a lot of what are called antioxidants. And some of the major ones are called polyphenols. And within the group of polyphenols, uh, there are compounds called anthocyanins. So these are just some of them. Anthocyanins are typically the polyphenols that give berries their, their color. So like the blues and the purples, for example, I mean, the oranges, for example, yellows of baked apples are due to anthocyanins, but a lot of them are more of the purple and red. And here you see these OH groups. So those are called hydroxyl groups. And those are really good at combating any sort of like hydroxyl, radic uh, hydroxyl radicals. It gives a strong antioxidant component. So berries, the fruits and the leaves have very high amounts of these types of polyphenols. So we've studied this a bit in my lab. So it's a combination of the chemistry as well as studying the effects on the brain or on brain tissue. So um, here I like this picture a lot because it looks like partridge berries uh, being spoken to by a blueberry. But we take the berry fruits and the leaves and we can add a variety of solvents to them. Um, these would be spun down, for example, in a centrifuge and basically get an extract from those berries uh, or from the, the substance of fruits or the leaves. And then we can store that extract. Um, it can be frozen for a while. And we're going to use those extracts to do chemical analysis as well as uh, studies on brain tissue. So this is just an example of an extract from bilberries. And this is a list of some of the anthocyanins that we found within an extract that was from the powder of the fruit of bilberries. And these are all well-known anthocyanins that are very um, very good antioxidants. So we, we try to do this as much as possible with any of the extracts that we're going to study further in the brain. So we get an idea of which compounds actually could be at work. So this is some more detailed, say, biochemical analysis of berry extracts. Um, in here, I show the species name of blueberry. So the low bush blueberries that we have that are very predominant here in Newfoundland and in Labrador are the species Vaccinium angustifolium. Whereas lingonberries or partridge berries are a vaccinium vitis day. So typically you need to use those species terms, of course, when publishing and also to know for sure which species of berry they are. But what this shows are total phenolics, anthocyanins, tannins, and flavonoids. So flavonoids, tannins, and anthocyanins are all different types of polyphenols. So we analyze the amounts or relative amounts in the fruits and leaves of blueberries. So that's the black bar here and partridge berries, which are the gray bars. And one of the trends we saw is that if you looked at the leaves, the leaves seem to have much more of the phenolic material compounds than the fruits themselves. The fruits are quite high. Um, so that really jumped out at us about how, I say, I don't know if you want to say potent, but just like how beneficial the leaves are and, and the compounds they have in them. So that was some basic biochemical analysis. But Further biochemical analysis was looking at the free radical scavenging um, ability as well as the reducing power. So reducing power in essence is the ox I'm sorry, the opposite of oxidation or oxidative stress. In here we saw, yes, measurable levels of free radical scavenging activity in blueberry and partridge berry fruits, um, as well as reducing power. But also you can see here the leaves have much more capacity to scavenge free radicals and to reduce oxidative species. So that was one of the first major findings we found. Uh, I think we published it about eight years ago. So the leaves are good as well as the fruits. 
fruits, yes, more tasty, I would say, but I think anyone would agree to that, but the leaves are also quite beneficial. This is um, a slide. I won't go into all the data here, but one of the things we can do, of course, is gather samples um, on a yearly basis throughout the, the course of the summer and the fall, for example, from different areas, not just in um, St. John's area, the Avalon, but obviously anywhere on the island. I've collected berries from Labrador as well, and then compare them and see basically year to year if there's differences in fluctuation or like within the same year if there's differences in fluctuation. So this, for example, shows total radical scavenging ability um, in some uh, samples, two different samples we picked in Pippi Park, for example. Keels, that's not in the St. John's area, that's up on the Bonavista Peninsula. And Fort Amherst, actually these were picked um, up above Fort Amherst if you go up the trail there. And there we can get a good comparison of, you know, how does the weather affect the berries, et cetera. So for example, you'll still see that the fruits here have good radical scavenging ability, but overall leaves had higher um, scavenging ability. So this is just to show you the type of data um, we can get. Um, I was very fortunate um, to be able to go to Fogo Island a couple of times. So I received um, a fellowship back in 20, well, it was 2017. I was on the island for a month as well as 2018. I was asked to return. Um, that was funded by Memorial University as well as the, as well as the Shorefast Foundation on Fogo. So I, sp I spent a month there and I picked a variety of berries, so not just blueberries, but also partridge berries, as well as um, crow berries, uh, bunch berries. And like, this is just showing you a general plot of where I picked berries. And some of the comparisons that were done, and I'm not gonna go into every single type of comparison, but this just shows antioxidant activity in a variety of partridge berries from different locations. And the first five here are all different locations found on Fogo Island, so Island Harbor, Lion's Den, Seldom, Joe Bats, well, it's Joe Bats Point, so just outside of Joe Bats Arm and Tilting. And overall, you can see there's very similar levels of anti antioxidant capacity, except for this um, location in Tilting, which was a little bit lower. But here I show a comparison to berries picked in Catalina. So that is up on the Bonavista Peninsula, and overall, the levels was were lower. So one thing I should note here is those berries in Catalina were picked about a week, up to about two weeks earlier than these picked here on the on the left. And I think probably most of you tuning in may know that obviously blue obviously we're almost peaking in blueberries now. Actually, they've been peaking for several weeks, probably well, at least the past two or three weeks. Partridge berries take a bit longer to ripen. So a lot of these samples were taken in um more of the late September into early October, where this one in Catalina was a bit before that. So it also shows that, well, yeah, there can be regional differences without a doubt, but the differences you get by letting the berries ripen longer as well. Also, besides blueberries and partridge berries, um, as I mentioned, I looked at a lot of different berry species on Fogo Island particularly, because I had a full month and, and more a few weeks, I'm mean, sorry, the next year, a few more weeks. And I looked at blueberries, Partridge berries or lingonberries, crowberries, which are shown here. Crowberries are the dark, um, like black um, berries that are show, shown here with this very kind of sharp leaves. There's also purple crowberries. These are the, the tip, more typical black crowberries. Bunch berries, also known as cracker berries, which are shown here. And dogberries. I've seen a lot of dogberry, um, unfortunately, a lot of limbs down because of uh, Hurricane Larry in the past few days. And hopefully people will pick those up and use them because as you can see here, yes, we have measurable. Free radical scavenging ability in all of the different types of fruits, but also the leaves from all of these different types of plants. Um, have even more radical scavenging or antioxidant activity than the fruits themselves. Um, this is showing 1 specific area I picked on Fogo Island from. Um, which was in the area of seldom. And what this shows is I picked, okay, so I picked fruits and leaves. These, uh, these are showing only blueberries. On the 14th of September in 2017, uh, 2017, sorry, I came back exactly a year later and picked up 14th of September, 2018. And what you can see is that this sample seemed to have slightly higher antioxidant capacity, the fruits and the leaves, then the samples from the year previous. Now, that being said, it was a year later and the samples from the uh, 2017 had been in the freezer for a year. So 
one of these samples, this one on the left, had been analyzed a year previous to this one on the far right. But this one here in the middle was had been frozen for a year. And we analyzed the data. And you can see here, it's very similar to the sample that was analyzed a year previous to that. It's lower than the uh, 2018 sample. But that being said, one thing it does show is that these polyphenols that have the antioxidant capacity can stay quite stable in a freezer for up to a year. And that's pretty well now now that um, known now is that you're probably going to maintain 90% or even more of the polyphenols if you freeze the berries properly, minus 20 freezer, which is a typical temperature of freezers we have in our home. So that's good news. So moving on to like what what do these berries actually do for us in a health sense in the brain? So as a neuroscientist, of course, I'm not a clinician, so I don't work directly with patients. I'm starting to, to do some of that, but you know, we have a patient, and this is just um, I have this picture here because this is a football player, a soccer player when I was in the Netherlands, um, Pierre von Hoydink, who commented on my research because we were studying the effects of like headers or repetitive brain injuries in, in soccer players. But like you have a patient, and of course, very complex. We're the most complex organism, at least we think we are in the on the planet. And like what if a if a soccer ball, if you're in a car accident, et cetera, what's happening to the brain? So we have to figure out what's happening in the brain. And like for me, I've done a lot of studies at the cellular level. So there's lots of different cells in the brain that you can actually take out of out of brains, for example. And I'll talk a bit about that. But then you have to extrapolate the findings in cells back to the brain or the finding in brain tissue back to what's actually happening to us in humans. And it can be particularly challenging. So I'm just going to talk a bit about some of the approaches we use or um, that I have in my lab. So in vitro approaches. So in vitro is Latin. That means in glass. What that really means is outside of an organism. So outside of a body, be it a human or say um, a rodent, for example, like a rat or a mouse. So like growing cells, for example, in a culture system, and I'll show you some examples of that. So there's good things and bad things. So you can screen compounds, for example, for activity, like extracts from berries. It's just faster to do that. Um, you can get an initial idea of how toxic some substances may be. You can figure out the mechanisms of neuroprotection or any type of protection could be cardiovascular a bit easier. And they're often less expensive than doing animals in vivo. In vivo means like in the whole organism, so in an animal. Um, of course, you're going to lose a complex cellular architecture of the brain. The brain is the most um, complex organ that we have. And often scientists have tested compounds at much higher concentrations that would actually get into the, the blood brain barrier. But we're pretty good about that. We try to estimate a concentration that would actually get into the brain. Because once you, for example, would eat berries, they can be broken down. In the gut, they'll be absorbed into the blood system. They may undergo a certain metabolism there, but they have to get across what's called the blood brain barrier to get into your brain and actually have an effect. That being said, um, I believe that a lot of compounds and berries are very good for the cardiovascular system. And what that does is it maintains good blood flow, and you probably get better blood flow to the brain while aging if you have um, antioxidants, for example, in your cardiovascular system. Another disadvantage, a lot of those cells that we use in a cell culture, they've been genetically altered in some way, so they're not quite the same cells you'd get in the brain. So typically we try to use both in vitro and in vivo approaches if we can. So like in, vi or in vitro approaches, um, we can dissect cells out of say mouse or rat brains, and this is a mouse brain. Um, and one advantage, you can take cells from specific brain areas. So what's shown here, this is an area called the hippocampus. The hippocampus is an area of the brain associated with memory, particularly short-term memory that like memories we store and then we move them into um, long-term memory eventually. But we can remove cells from the hippocampus. It can be other parts of the brain as well. And look at neurons. So those are the red cells here and glia. Those are um, about 90% of the cells in the brain and those are shown here in green. And we can grow those in wells and we keep them at 37 degrees with proper oxygenation, oxygenation, for example, and we can injure them in some way and then measure damage to them. So one of the compounds that we will administer to these cells that are growing in this culture system, so they typically grow about two, maybe three weeks in a culture system. We give them a compound called glutamate, also known as glutamic acid. Now, that is a very important amino acid. We need it for a lot of different things in the body for survival. It's also the major neurotransmitter, at least excitatory 
neurotransmitter in the brain. And the thing is, if it's present in too high of an amount, then it can kill cells. And that happens, for example, in times of stroke, that happens in times of traumatic brain injury, but it's also believed that as we age, we have higher levels of glutamate. So what we do is we add this to cells in this culture system, and we can label the cells in the culture with this, it's a dye called DAPI, so the, the nuclei or the nucleus of a cell would stain blue, and it makes it very easy to count them. Um, so we can count the control cells, the ones we add glutamate to, and those that we have glutamate, and then in the presence of blueberry extracts. And what's shown here in these graphs is like this would be the control. So that's 100% of the cells present. Glutamate typically would kill about 30% of these cells. That's shown over here as well on the right side. When this was done in the presence of fruit or berry extract, so here blueberry, it completely protected the cells. The partridge berry fruits were not protected, but the lingonberry fruits were. I didn't believe this data when I saw it. I had my students repeat it several times, and we always basically saw the same trend. So if the extracts are present at the time of giving glutamate, that this toxin, then they seem to be quite protective. There's another type of injury that we have studied as well. And here's that individual that uh, commented on my research. Um, this was many years ago, so Kopzorgen, that means uh, head care. So no, we don't really put you know, helmets on mice and, you know, hit them in the head. Um, there are similar types of studies, but I try to do, I, I try to do the studies in a cellular sense. So we have this cell injury model. What it is, it's a model of mechanical injury. So we grow cells on the membrane. So I showed you a plate that had six wells in it. So we grow the, we grow the cells here. And these membranes are silastic, meaning what they are, they're deformable. So this is, um, before any pressure is being applied. This injury model, we put this little um, piece on top of a cell member, or a well, I'm sorry, and then we give it a pressure. We give it pressure pulse, and it, defl it deflects the membrane very quickly, like with uh, 50 milliseconds. So this is something that would happen, for example, if you hit your head. If you were in a, um, a car accident at a certain, say, like about 45 miles per hour, something like that, which is pretty high. Um, but it's fairly easy to use, and I've used it for many years. So I wanted to see what happened is if we injured these cells in the presence of extracts from blueberries. So on the right here in this graph, again, we use this uh, DAPI compound to count the amount of cells. So this is 100% uh, sorry, of cells that haven't been injured. There's always error because there's a difference in each well of how many cells are going to live. But when we injured these cells mechanically and waited 24 hours, about two thirds of them were gone. When we did this in the presence of blueberry extract, it was remarkable. It was complete protection. Again, I didn't believe it. it seemed too good to be true. But um, in this particular set of studies, it was very protective. We repeated the same experiments with, um, so those were done with blueberry extracts that we had, um, we had picked those, um, collected them ourselves. We also received, um, some commercial extracts as well from a company. This one was partridge berries, same kind of thing. 100% is a control here. When we injure them, we lost a lot of cells. In this case, it was only about a third. But when the berries, the lingonberries were present, again, complete protection. Another study we did was injure the cells in the presence of the solvent. So the thing is, the extract is still in a solvent when you add it to these wells, to the cells. Granted, it's a very low concentration, but we always want to make sure that that's not playing a role and sure enough, no, the injury levels were the same. So again, more evidence that um, these extracts were protective. And then I was very interested in studying neurodegenerative diseases and Parkinson's disease is what I've spent some time on, at least models of it. Uh, many of you may be familiar with this disease. So it's a, it's a neurodegenerative disease where individuals um, start having tremor um, while at rest and initiating movement is very difficult. It, um, onset is usually, you know, age of 50 or above. Um, it's about two thirds men versus, um, uh, I should say male versus female, sorry. Um, and what typically happens is there, there's a loss of cells that produce dopamine, which is a very important neurotransmitter. And when this happens, you start to see evidence of the disease in general. If you look at individuals 
postmortem or in animal models of the disease. Um, and a lot of this was done postmortem years ago by someone named Louis. You find um, Louis bodies, and that's what's shown here. The Louis bodies, what they are, they are aggregates of a protein called alpha synuclein. Alpha synuclein, we don't know exactly what it does. It is likely a structural protein, but in a normal sense, in normal cells, you don't see this, but that's what happens in Parkinson's disease. So alpha synuclein is believed to contribute to Parkinson's disease. Um, this is a neuron. So that typically happens in neurons, the alpha synuclein, but when they become damaged, they can release alpha synuclein. And when they release alpha synuclein, they can activate cells that are called microglia. And microglia are the innate immune cells in the brain. They basically are going to fight off, say, a virus or a bacterial infection, et cetera. But basically, if they are if they receive any sort of information from bacteria or viruses, or if alpha synuclein binds to them, they become activated. They think there's an infection, and they they start releasing about a a lot of toxic factors, and this can feed back and further damage neurons. So we use alpha synuclein as a toxin, and this. Um, particular set of experiments was done in microglial cells themselves, so the immune cells. This is a control, so this is with the DAPI, and this is a, another marker specifically for microglia in green. And then we added alpha synuclein as a toxin. The cells typically become larger because they're becoming activated. They think that there's some sort of infection. And this just shows an example of if we added um, alpha synuclein in the presence of extracts from leaves. This same measurement as some of the previous graphs. 100% control glutamate in microglia killed about 40% of them. If fruit was added, we didn't see a protection, but leaf extract complete protection. In the presence of alpha synuclein, about a 40% cell death. And if you added fruit or leaf extract in the presence of alpha synuclein, it protected the microglia. Again, pretty fascinating for us. So just some. Um, just going to try to finish up with one last uh, study that we've done in the lab. So, like, there, there are some data out there, and it's been around for now, you know, 15, 20 years that showed, for example, well, for one, that di dietary supplementation with blueberries can decrease age related behavioral de deficits. So you can measure certain types of memory in rodents and rats and mice. And if you keep them on a blueberry diet for several weeks, it improves those deficits. There was a study done way back in 2013 that bilberries, if um, indivi or individuals, as in mice, um, these were mice that was an animal model of Alzheimer's disease. Bilberry, um, a bilberry disease could decrease deficits in this Alzheimer's model. And also, very interesting to me, a couple studies that showed if you put rats on a diet enriched with blueberry, it would protect them from stroke, if they like an ischemic stroke, which is when you have a lack of oxygen. So, very interesting. So we've done some studies with diet and something you always have to think about is the bioavailability. That is, so like if you eat something, um, how, much, how much of it is actually gonna get to the site of action? So this is with any sort of drug you would take orally, right? Um, if you're injected with a drug, obviously you get um, availability, bioavailability much faster and a much to a much greater extent. But if we're gonna be eating berries or drinking a, a tea with leaves, this is important. So there were a few, um, studies done that showed, yes, these polyphenols in berries can get into the brains. One was done in rats and another was done in pigs. So we've kind of, based on these studies, we've calculated how much we would want to add. Um, so this is a fairly recent study. We've just, well, we started it about two years ago in 2019. Um, it took a while to process the data and stuff. And of course, we've had the pandemic to deal with. Our lab has been shut down a lot in the past two years, a year and a half at least. Um, this is a mouse model of Parkinson's disease. So we use these mice, they're called C57 black six. That's a specific strain of mice. And we gave, um, we had three different groups. One was given a regular diet, like the chow that they have. And we actually did a mash. We mashed um, their chow up. And then we put another group on a blueberry diet where we, um, we added um, blueberries, um, so they're fresh, and this was the fruits, no leaves, um, to their diet. So they started the blueberry diet for several days, and then the control group got an injection of saline, so that's um, water with a bit of salt, 0.9% salt. 
And the other two groups got injected with a compound called MPTP. I don't have time to go into all the details about this, but this was a neurotoxin discovered. Geez, I think it's been, it's probably been 35, almost 40 years. Um, that can cause it. It can cause symptoms of Parkinson's disease, and it's been used as an animal model of Parkinson's disease now for now 30 to 35 years. Um, and what this causes is a slow de degeneration of those dopaminergic neurons that are so important. And so basically what we did, we gave five injections of this drug on a daily basis. This was already established in the literature and then looked at the effects of the different diets and we did some behavioral testing. And I'll just show you some of that and I'll have time to go into all of it. One is called the roto rod. So you can see here are some mice on the roto rod and you can imagine this is spinning um, towards you um, or towards the animals. So rodents like to stay on it. They're going to keep walking as it rotates. And basically, you can measure the length of time they stay on it, and you can change the speed of it. Um, and eventually, they'll they'll fall off if it goes too fast, or if they have a um, issue with brain tissue, for example, they've experienced any problems with motor coordination. But when they fall off, it's not a long fall. We make sure they don't get hurt. But um, the data is fed right to a computer. And what this shows on the left is the average time that they stay on the rotor rod. So this isn't a control. Um, and this was a, a constant revolution per minute of 15. I can see here it's 40 with the MPTP group. They stayed on less. It was about 5 or 6 seconds left and with the blueberry group, it went back up. The problem here is, even though we saw this trend, it wasn't significant statistically. And that's likely because we just, we had um, 12 animals in each group and we probably needed more. That being said, uh, I've shown this to some researchers and they were surprised we even saw a trend at all, meaning um, it was probably something that was really happening. This is the accelerated rotor rod where we actually, you start at a low speed and increase it and we didn't pick up much of a difference there. But it was encouraging. We did another test called the light dark box. So you can see half of this box here is covered. The other is open. And typically animals, rodents, for example, don't like to be out in the light. They prefer to be kind of in the dark. They're nocturnal animals. They feel safer there. And what this is typically believed to be, it could be a measure of anxiety or risk. And this is an expression of the time spent in the light arm. So this is a control animal. So you do a trial and you measure the amount of time. Um, and you can see MPTP animals spent more time in the light arm. And then when they were treated with blueberries, it went back down. That being said, it wasn't quite significant, but the trend was there. And this again is probably because we didn't have enough animals. But if they spend more time in the light, it could mean there's some disruption to brain areas involved with anxiety. But we do have to do a lot more experimentation to, to support that claim. And then, so anyway, we saw the trends, but after the end of the experiment, so, so that, was, that was about three weeks after they received their last injection of MPTP where we did the behavioral studies, and then we waited another week or so, and the animal were, animals were, I would say sacrifice the, the or terminal, the, terminal part of the experiment um, we, and we um, took out part of their brain tissue and this is showing um, what's called the midbrain. So that's an area of the brain that's affected by Parkinson's with a lot of dopamine cells. And this is looking at protein levels of tyrosine hydroxylase. That enzyme is expressed in very high levels in these dopamine neurons and is considered a marker for them. So this is a control level um, looking at protein levels and you can see MPTP treated mice had a significant reduction in tyrosine hydroxylase, and that suggests they had less dopaminergic neurons. And then look what happened when we had the animal, we measured the tissue in the animals that were treated with MPTP, but they were on a blueberry diet. So this group here in the middle was on a normal diet. It completely protected these dopaminergic cells. So that was a really good finding, and we still have a bit more data to, to analyze. So now we've moved. Uh, we've moved to this animal model. Um, I'm not sure how much we're going to do it in the, in the near future. Because some, you know, some of the future di um, directions, we may look at other proteins or cell markers in the brains. Um, we still have some brain tissue left from this past study. There's other types of natural substances I'm interested in. It looks like I'm going to have some funding to study various cannabinoids, like say CBD uh, for neuroprotective effects and similar models, and also shagga mushroom. I think eventually we'd like to see how many of the compounds in these types of substances get in the brain, as I mentioned. Um, and then also, I don't think it's all about antioxidant capacity. I think there's a lot of other things going on, like anti-inflammatory pathways, et cetera. So we'd really like to measure other things in the body 
that could be contributing uh, to these protective effects. And lastly, um, I mean, I really can take, obviously I take some of the credit for this work, but I can't take most of it because I just couldn't do it without the, the great students and um, postdocs technicians that I've had in the lab, mostly students. So it's been a good combination of, of graduate students as well as undergraduate students here, um, not just from the School of Pharmacy, but other, other departments like biochemistry and psychology that have contributed to this work over the past 10 or 12 years. This uh, picture here was taken two summers ago, not last summer, but um, when we last got out to actually pick, pick berries for the lab and all our fund the funding here. So, uh, of course, Memorial University for supporting me in my lab all these years, NSERC, the Shore Ferris Foundation for sending me or allowing me to go to FOGO, Wild Blueberry Association, North America and Canada Foundation for Innovation. And I believe, um, I believe that's it. And I'm, I'll take, uh, as many questions as we have time for. I think we got at least 20 minutes. Grace, huge thank you to Dr. Weber for that really informative and fascinating presentation. I would also like to thank both of our sponsors for today's event. Johnson Insurance offers Memorial University alumni specially designed policies and preferred rates on home and auto insurance as well as travel insurance. So you can call the number provided or visit the web link for additional information. And secondly, Manulife. If you need new or supplemental life, health and dental insurance, this recently added program for alumni and members of the Memorial community is something you should check out. So we're gonna jump right into questions. Dr. Weber said uh, he's um, able to take a few questions now while we still have some time. Um, so you can see again on the right hand side of your screen, I had just posted in the chat, but if you pull up the Q&A just below the chat, you will be able to post your questions there. So I will um, keep an eye on that um, as well as some other questions that we had come in beforehand. So let me jump to the first one. Okay, um, Dr. Weber, if you can just talk for a sec earlier, you mentioned about berries protecting against the effects of traumatic brain injuries and, and you were referencing the soccer player about sort of the, the head injuries. You also mentioned stroke um, in, in prevention, but I'm just curious about how it affects if somebody's had a stroke, um, would it be used as a treatment then? And if so, how quickly should it be administered? So, yeah, so the fine, yeah, our findings, show that if these polyphenols are in higher levels in the brain because someone's had ingested them, then they may be you know, slightly better off, at least if they experience a, a brain injury or stroke at the time. So it's a very good question because typically what we've found and other labs have found this too, is after a stroke or after, after a brain injury, there's, they're obviously not as strong as an effect, but I know with the, the issue with stroke, so I mean, I still think they're beneficial and I know there's some positive data that shows they can be beneficial during recovery. It's just not as strong an effect um, in any of the models you have if it's present in the brain at the time of the injury. But as far as the timing of after, that's a really good question. I don't know for sure. I don't think I can answer that adequately because um, there's always, like, for example, yeah, that's always a big um, issue in stroke is knowing when to treat somebody, how quickly to introduce anything new into the brain tissue. I know like a tissue plasminogen activator is a compound that's been used to treat patients after stroke. And there's always been debate as how quickly you do it. Like, is it three hours? Should you wait longer? And I don't think we can say for sure when it's safe. I don't, I don't think you'd put somebody on polyphenols within the first say few days though, for example, but maybe after the person's starting to recover uh, within a week, two weeks, something like that. But that's, that's probably the best I can answer that question. Great, thank you. Um, there's so many questions coming in. They're all piling on top of each other. Um, so I'm going to try to get through them in the order that they're posted. Uh, so somebody had said, I gather that frozen berries are just as good as fresh. And what about dried? So I know you did reference earlier that uh, the berries that had been frozen had similar levels of antioxidants when you tested them a year later. So freezing berries doesn't alter then the health benefits. Yeah. So yeah, that's what we found is so about a year in the freezer, there's almost as many 
um, antioxidant species like polyphenols in the berries. That being said, like I always find fresh berries just taste the best, uh, but you're just not going to lose a lot of the beneficial health, health effects for about, about a year. After about a year, you will start seeing a decline in the amount, but even like a few years later, you'll still see a sufficient amount that makes them very healthy. As far as dried, that's an excellent question because tip, um, there was a co company, um, Natural Newfoundland Nutraceuticals, which is where we got our extracts, and they used a very specific type of drying technique. And what they found, it maintained, I think, 94% of those bioactive compounds. And I think this also la lasted up to about a year. That being said, that was if they were still um, like unopened, it was still a sealed package. As soon as you open the powder and it's a more exposed to like just natural air, it will start to degrade. But that being said, if the powder is also frozen, it will it will still be good, just as good roughly after a year and probably even longer after a couple more years. So nice. definitely, yes, powders are a good way to go because they're nice to like right. introduce them in yogurt, et cetera, all sorts of things. Right, and have a shelf life, obviously, that is a little bit longer than fresh. Yeah, <laughs> and most companies that will, they'll put a shelf life on it because they want right. to guarantee it. But yeah, I would say they're gonna for several months at, at least they'll be good. Right, amazing. Uh, Lorna Clark asks: Does increased length of time of consuming berries or leaf tea decrease brain damage, or is it constant? Increased length of time, you said of increased length of time of consuming berries or leaf tea. So I guess okay. how long you've been. Using it. Yeah. So ideally, it's like. If you, if you are consistently, say, eating fruits or um, drinking tea, overall, the, the effects are going to going to be better. Now, this depends like what age you are, what state, you know, how your health status is, et cetera. But that's an interesting question as well, because a lot of data shows that um, if you ingest polyphenols, they may you, there's still trace amounts after about a day, but you really get m most of the like. The polyphenols are if you do tests like in the blood or in, in someone's urine, they're for you know the first several hours, but they're not going to last a full day. So it's kind of important that you continue to use or eat them, because yeah, you'll get those beneficial effects of them being in the brain for you know two three hours, um, and it probably initiates processes in the brain that we just haven't measured yet. But it's probably important to continue to do that on a daily, at least every other day basis. Um, for as long that, as that was going to be my follow up question, Dr. Weber. Is it is it a daily thing? Should it be that people are eating berries and a variety of berries, I guess, on a daily basis? If if possible, I don't okay. th like and one of the rules and this isn't a hard fast set rule. Um, like a cup of blueberries a day. OK, um, wow, a cup. that's a cup and that's good, but we can't right. always get access to a cup of blueberries a day. Sure. So even a half a cup is going to be beneficial. Right. Um, but if you think about the leaves. Probably about 10% of the of in weight of leaves, if you can make a tea out of that, is mm. going to be roughly equivalent to that. So you must be seeing the questions coming in, Dr. Weber, because one yes. says, How would you recommend consuming the leaves of the berries? Would oh, you yeah. dry them and make a tea? <laughs> yeah, I have seen some of them. Yes, I am um, I prefer to make a tea. Okay. Um, now I find the the leaves are quite astringent compared compared or a little bitter, of course, compared to the fruits. But what I typically do, I sometimes will make a tea with um, just blueberry leaves. I often will add blueberry leaves in with other types of teas that I drink. Um, and, you know, that's up to personal preference. But right. I, do know, I know several individuals that actually grind up the leaves and add them to a variety of things, like yogurt is a big one. And like like I said, right, if you can do that, it's it's great. But like I, I find that, um, yeah, that I don't know. I just I prefer them in teas and that's. You know, as long as you don't boil the leaves in the water, like I, that's typical with most teas anyway, a lot of substances, just heat up the water in a kettle like you normally do, and then add it to the leaves. You're going right. to get most of those compounds coming out of the, the leaf tissue, and it's going to be in the water in the tea itself. Right. Excellent. Uh, Susan Osman asks, has there been any research done on MS patients? There has been some research done on MS patients. Um, Actually, I was going to start um, some work here with Michelle Palman, who's over in, um, well, she's a, she's a faculty member here at Memorial University, and she's primarily in the Miller Center. She works with um, MS patients, and she wanted to start a study um, on, on blueberry diet. We just haven't, we haven't gotten around to it yet. But I did see, unfortunately, I don't remember the specifics, 
I saw a study come out a couple years ago, and I don't remember the findings. I don't think they were overly strong. They certainly won't ne weren't negative, but it's it's very minimal what's been done in MS patients. But I don't okay. I don't remember that paper specifically. Sorry about that. No problem. Thank you. Um, Rebecca Bennett asks. Previously in the talk, it was mentioned that PD has a higher risk ratio for males. For the most recent experiment with the BL6 mice, was the experiment done with males and females? If not, do you believe that there may that there may be different results if A, you reran the experiment with more mice, or B, included subgrouping including female mice? That's an excellent question. So, uh, yeah, I didn't point that out. That was only done with male mice, and yeah. So there's there's a couple of reasons for that. I I, I pointed out that roughly it's roughly two thirds, maybe it's about sixty percent of PD patients are male. Um, so, um, but so we decided to go with male mice first, but it was also just a logistics issue. So we just didn't have enough um, space to run enough animals, for example. Um, as well as enough researchers that we could do an adequate job. And it was it was almost more of a pilot study. So that so part of the idea is now, yes, run more animals, because I think with the trends we saw with only 12 animals, I I'm almost guaranteeing we will see the um, a difference there. But as far as female animals, that was going to be one of our next steps as well. So I would like to run a huge cohort, a huge group. Uh, if we have enough researchers in space, for example, in our care, animal care facility, that we would do equal numbers, male and female, and do a great um, comparison between those two, because um, it would be interesting. I can't predict for sure if you'd see better effects in male versus female. It's possible. Of course, female mice have an estrogen cycle, so that would be something that could contribute to the differences. But absolutely, I'd like to do, well, both those things, increase numbers overall, but also include female animals. Excellent. Uh, there's a few people had asked questions about the the leaves and how to consume them. So I, I think we've said um, your preference would be to make them into a tea. Yeah. Uh, another comment there. Nice presentation, Dr. Weber. Just wondering when doing the in vitro experiment on brain tissue with leaves or fruit extracts, what concentration did you use? Was the same as leaves contain? Was the leaves the sorry? Was that the same as leaves contain high antioxidant properties? So what we did, yeah, okay. So when we, when we did this, the experiments with the cells, when we first did it, we we added the same amount, so the, as in the same volume. And, but as I showed, yeah, leaves have roughly, at least most experiments we've done on average, it would be about 10 times the capacity. So then of course we saw, yeah, much more protective effects with leaves. So then most of the experiments I showed though, we adjusted for that. And so we added one tenth of the volume of the leaf extract. So, in theory, you should have the same amount of polyphenols in the leaf versus the fruit extract. And that's when we saw very similar findings. Excellent. Has your group done any tests, excuse me, uh, of the effect of neuroprotection of berries or leaves on brain cells exposed to carbon monoxide? Ooh, we have not. Nope. Um, geez, I never even, I never had that on my list and think about it, <laughs> but um, it would be interesting. No, I haven't done that. And the next question, is there any research that's been conducted with on dementia? Yes, so um, it's, there have been some studies done with, um, I guess you would say advanced aging. So um, it's difficult to do um, experiments like that with patients that have dementia um, or Alzheimer's versus um, let's say advanced aging, but haven't actually been diagnosed with dementia, um, there definitely are studies done. There have been some studies in Alzheimer's patients that have shown um, a beneficial effect. Now, there's not a lot of them, don't get me wrong. Most of the studies done though are have been with um, older individuals that haven't been diagnosed because it's just, uh, that's a whole, whole other issue there is like getting consent for the studies, et cetera. Right. And unfortunately things like remembering to have the blueberry diet every day and stuff like that. So you'd have to have a good caretaker to keep track of that with dementia patients. So sure. overall, like I I showed some of the animal model, I mean, sorry, studies that done in animals show beneficial effects. There have definitely been beneficial effects shown in individuals, some in Alzheimer's, mostly those that say advanced aging. And I believe, I don't know exactly 
um, in dementia as well, but I'm not sure the extent of it and like what stages of dementia they're at. But overall, in older individuals on berry diets, um, there's a lot of data that shows that there's um, when you measure memory, for example, that it helps to maintain memory. Wow. And there's all different levels of you know how much you eat and how long and stuff, so it's sure. quite very. But overall, um, I haven't seen anything bad, but I've right. definitely seen papers that have shown no benefit. Okay, so it's usually either no benefit or a definite benefit. And maybe Dr. Weber, as we mentioned, will send out the recording of the event to people's email. So maybe if there's any sure. studies that you have links to that's accessible, we could include those in the email as well. Sure. Just wondering, um, so we talked about, you mentioned earlier the, the berries on FOGO and you had samples from uh, the Avalon Peninsula. So comparing Newfoundland berries, do you have research on, on looking at berries from other locations in Canada and, uh, and around the world? How do Newfoundland berries compare? So I haven't myself done anything outside of Newfoundland and Labrador. I've done some, I've looked at some um, partridge berries from Labrador. Um, typically they're called red berries up there. And so I've only compared different reasons, uh, sorry, regions of Newfoundland and Labrador. And so to, to know for sure, like what, how our berries compare to other parts of the world, I'd have to run the same experiments. But overall, the data that I've seen and all of the um, research I've looked at is that we are, I don't think there's anywhere that has higher amounts of the antioxidant like anthocyanins. There's a lot of berries in Scandinavia that are excellent and some within Canada as well. But I don't think, and again, it can, it can depend on the season, their seasonal variation, and that could be different in other parts of Canada versus say Scandinavia, where you find a lot of these berries as well. But we're always considered to have some of the best berries in the world. And there's also because like, we have a very clean environment as well. Right. Very little worry about, that's also sometimes a worry, like, you know, if you pick berries on the side of the road, you have, you know, and other toxins that could be in soil. We have a very clean environment here, which makes that's just kind of adds to it. Even if we had similar levels of polyphenols, that extra benefit of them being pretty clean and being in a clean environment makes them some of the best. Right. I mean, in Newfoundland and Labrador, I'm sure, you know, we would brag that they are the best in the world. But uh, if we have the science to back it up, then we can really say that that's true. <laughs> yeah, they're definitely amongst the best. Right. <laughs> uh, I think that's all the questions. I was just double checking the chat window and there were some people asking about recommending how ingesting the leaves. So we chatted about that and just going to double check the Q&A again. Um, again, about the leaves mainly. So I think I think we've we've covered all of the questions and certainly if people have more, they can email us at any time. We will be sending out a follow up email. Um, so I'm just going to have. Chris, pull up our concluding slide. So we've now come to the end of our time together. Uh, I can't believe we're at 156. That, that hour just flew by. So I would like to once again sincerely thank Dr. Weber for his time and for sharing his expertise with us. So before we clue up, Dr. Weber, do you have any final words? Well, I just want to say thanks again for inviting me to do this. I'm happy to do it. I typically do something like this every fall. It's not quite fall, I guess, a, a week officially. But And also everyone that came online, um, especially if anyone's local, it's a beautiful sunny day. So a good day to get out there and um, pick some berries if possible. If anybody wanted to post their uh, best berry picking spots and share their secrets with yeah. us before we go, we'd love to hear. I will say uh, we've been doing a lot of berry picking so far this September and we've been up in, in Pippi Park and, uh, and lots, lots of berries up there. So it's been great. So thank you again. This was really, really fascinating. Thank you to all of you out there for attending and for your great questions. If you enjoyed today's event, please check out our alumni website for other upcoming events and you will see them posted on the screen there. September 29th, a behind the scenes look, the Hidden Memorial is Signal Hill Campus. October 13th, Coastlines event with Alan Doyle and an email just went out today. So uh, keep an eye on your inboxes. That will be both an in-person and virtual event with Alan Doyle. October 19th, Gender Diversity will be our next Mon Alum 101. And October 27th, we'll be celebrating our alumni through the 40th Annual Alumni Tribute Awards, and you will be able to join us online for that. So again, as I indicated earlier, the session has been recorded, and I will be sharing a link in an upcoming email. So keep an eye on your inbox. 
Uh, I just also want to give two quick thank yous to my colleagues and alumni engagement. Janet Heron actually organized the event today, was unable to host, but she's watching with her family. So shout out to Janet and Chris Hounsell, who has been providing all of the technical assistance for this event. So thank you. So everyone enjoy the rest of your day and goodbye. Thanks.